So welcome everyone. Hello, I think everybody in the room at this point knows who I am, but I'm Judy Black. I'm president of the RAS Califax Center. I uh, want to remind everyone in attendance today that um, if you have questions, please use the chat. Um, uh, Pat, uh, if, if when I'm speaking, if you could monitor the chat for me, please. And I will monitor the chat for the other speakers as they present. If you have a question uh, during the presentation, and but don't want to forget to ask it, please put it in the chat and we'll make sure that it does get asked. And please mute your microphone if it hasn't been already, but looking at the participant list, everyone has. So thank you very much for that. For guests, uh, and I don't think there are any at this point who haven't attended one of our sessions before, but I will go through for those that uh, will view this in future who aren't. Uh, there are several perks to joining the RASC and uh, some of them are. For instance, you automatically get your copy of the Observer's Handbook. Uh, this is the current one. Uh, you also get a copy of the Explore the Universe, and I realize this is version two, but there is a version three now available that I have not purchased. You also get a subscription to Sky News, and this is the latest edition for the September-October. Now, uh, there certainly were two other editions um, during the summer months. And you also get a subscription. Um, I get mine in print version, but you can also get the electronic version if you so wish. There is a little extra cost for getting the, the print version. Uh, but nonetheless, that is available to you. From the Halifax Center, you certainly get access to our Nova Notes and to all special events that we hold in the center, as well as access to our library and to our St. Croix Observatory. And the most important part of joining the RASC is the access to an incredible network of people across the country, and especially in this center, who are highly knowledgeable and very, very willing to share that knowledge. And that was one of the drawing cards for me, and I'm sure many other members, because of the camaraderie and the willingness to share. So welcome aboard. And certainly happy birthday to all of you who have uh, celebrated a birthday over the, over the summer months and up until we meet again until November 6th. Uh, congratulations on another successful circumnavigation of the sun. And on that note, I'm going to share my screen. So again, welcome. Uh, you can contact our center through several means. One is our website, which is halifax.rasp.ca, and that contains all sorts of information uh, regarding our center. You can also view our YouTube channel, which go to YouTube and search out RASC Halifax Center, or RASC Halifax, actually. And if you wish to have a, a comment or a question, please email us at president at halifax.rasp.ca. The first thing I would like to note is that RASC Halifax Center would like to begin by acknowledging that we are in the Mi'kmaq, the ancestral and unceded territory of the Mi'kmaq people. This territory is covered by the treaties of peace and friendship in which Mi'kmaq and Maliseet peoples first signed with the British Crown in 1725. The treaties did not deal with surrender of lands or resources, but in fact recognized Mi'kmaq and Maliseet title and established the rules for what was to be an ongoing relationship between nations. I'd also like to note that as of yesterday, uh, which was the 35th annual Treaty Day in Nova Scotia, it also happened to be the start of Mi'kmaq History Month in which we celebrate their culture and contribution. So look to the news items for in our news well, not RAS news, but in, in local news regarding uh, the various celebrations that are going to be held in the coming month. We'd also like to welcome everyone again that is in attendance. Uh, we'd like to note that RASC, as well as RASC Halifax Center, believes in and practices inclusivity and diversity. All are welcomed regardless of age, disability, gender, gender reassignment, marriage and civil partnership, pregnancy and maternity, race, ethnic origin, color, nationality, national origin, religion or belief, or sex and sexual orientation. We are opposed to all forms of unlawful and unfair discrimination. In all our members meetings, we also hope that we are providing interesting topics for a wide variety of our viewers. And just a reminder again that this session is being recorded and will be posted on our YouTube channel in just the next couple, in the next few days. The agenda is this today. We've already gone through the welcome. Up next will be our two special guests. David Hoskin will 
address hydrogen alpha solar imaging, followed by Patrick Kelly, uh, the instability gap and cosmic distances. Dave Chapman, our observing chair, will then provide the what's up in October skies. And last but not least, I will provide news from the board. Following that, the recording will cease and members who are wanting to remain online can do so and we will have a very informal unrecorded astro chat. So please join us uh, for that part of the, uh, the meeting as well. So, and I'm going to stop my share at this point. And so first up on our agenda for speakers, I have David Hoskin. So David is a member of our board, a longtime member. This is a gentleman who photographs night sky as well as solar images, which makes us always wonder when does this dear soul ever get to sleep? But I'm sure he will address that in his solar imaging uh, session. So, so David, um, go for it, go ahead. You are muted, sir. There. Okay, let me share my screen and go to. Okay, um, so I think the best way to start uh, talking about solar imaging in, in terms of uh, hydrogen alpha imaging is to. Um, go through a brief uh, description of the structure of our sun, uh, which is uh, quite a, a fascinating uh, object in, in itself. Uh, the core is where the sun generates its energy uh, by a fusion reaction. So fusing uh, hydrogen uh, into helium. And uh, the core is very hot, uh, 15 uh, million degrees Celsius is the uh, estimated temperature of the sun. So you're basically inside a, a nuclear reaction, inside a, a hydrogen bomb. Um, surrounding the uh, core is the radiative zone. Um, and this isn't as dense as the core, although it's still solid. Um, and the plasma within is packed so densely that convection can't take place. So the energy that's coming from the uh, from the core has to diffuse through this radiative zone. And it takes something like 170,000 years for photons to go from the core uh, and cross the radiative zone. Um, then we come to the convective zone, um, shown here. And this is uh, the zone between the radiative zone and the photosphere. The uh, top layer of the connective zone is uh, uh, about the same temperature as the photosphere, so about uh, 4,500 to 6,000 uh, degrees uh, Celsius, whereas the temperature at the base is closer to the temperature of the outer part of the radiative zone. Uh, that being about 2 million degrees Celsius. So there's a real temperature, an incredible temperature differential across the convective zone. And that gives rise to very turbulent um, convection pattern that uh, causes the plasma to, to rise and fall, rise and fall. So the, the, this part of the sun, if you're looking at it, um, looks like it's boiling. Um, above, but separating the uh, convective zone and the photosphere, um, this is the, uh, let's go to the photosphere. The, um, this is the visible portion um, of the sun. Uh, temperature there is about 4,500, as I said, to 6,000 degrees Celsius. And um, almost all the radiation from the sun is uh, emitted from this uh, thin layer, which is about 100 kilometers uh, in thickness. Um, when we're imaging with white light, uh, so with a solar uh, filter over a, a, a reflector, or refractor, or schmidt cassegrain any type of telescope, um, we're, we're looking at the photosphere. Um, and we can see the uh, granulation um, pattern, which is due to the convection um, within the photosphere. And uh, if there are sunspots present, uh, we also see those in, in, in the uh, photosphere by uh, white light imaging. Now above the photosphere 
is the chromosphere that's uh, shown here. The chromosphere um, is about uh, between one and, and 2000 kilometers uh, in thickness. Um, the temperature rises in the chromosphere compared to the um, photosphere. So at the top of the uh, uh, chromosphere, the temperature is about 36,000 degrees Celsius. Uh, this is hot enough to excite hydrogen uh, to emit its uh, a characteristic red light at uh, 6,562.8 angstroms. The plasma, and that's what we're, we're viewing when we do hydrogen alpha uh, solar imaging. We're looking at that particular wavelength of, of red light. Um, plasma density is, uh, is much less than it is in the photosphere. Um, solar flares originate from the chromosphere. And uh, when we do hydrogen alpha uh, observing or imaging, we're able to see the, the, uh, some of the prominent features of the chromosphere. So these would be uh, prominences, filaments, and uh, plasias. Prominences are dense concentrations of solar plasma that are suspended above the sun surface by tangled magnetic field lines. Uh, filaments are simply um, prominences viewed top down. Uh, and plages are bright regions uh, that are associated with uh, solar activity um, and, and usually sunspots or, or sunspots that are in the process of developing. Uh, then we come to the uh, transition region. Uh, which is a thin irregular layer that uh, separates the chromosphere from the much hotter uh, corona. And uh, the corona then is the sun's outermost atmosphere. Uh, temperature there has gone up again. Plasma is more than a million degrees uh, Celsius uh, within, the within the corona. And it extends uh, uh, millions of kilometers into outer space. And this is the source of, of solar wind. So just to um, give you a sense of, of the differences between white light observing uh, slash imaging and hydrogen alpha um, images. On the left, um, we see a, a, a white light image of the sun. These were taken yesterday by the uh, observers at the Laboratory of X-ray Astronomy of the Sun in uh, the Lebedev Institute in, the, in Russia. Um, and you see here uh, the, the two sunspots that are currently visible. Um, and they're quite prominent. Uh, if you look closely, you can see the granulation uh, due to the convection. But that's really all you're going to see um, with white light imaging. Um, you might see some brighter areas around sunspots. Um, but, but that's really it. So the sun looks pretty, pretty tame by white light imaging. Um, <clears throat> but Remember, that's that's looking at the surface of the sun. That's the, that's the uh, looking at the the solid layer. Um, if we look at hydrogen alpha, so we're looking at the chromosphere, which lies above the photosphere. We're seeing a lot more uh, happening. So uh, these are the sunspots, and you can see the plages, uh, the white areas uh, associated with the sunspots. Um, Here's a filament, so that's a, uh, um, a, uh, a prominence uh, being viewed uh, top down. Uh, what else have we got here? Um, well, if you look closely, you can see a prominence here. Um, this, this particular picture isn't, om isn't optimized to show prominences, but, uh, but there is one there. Uh, point of fact, uh, what's it? A week ago, there was a, a, a really impressive prominence uh, visible, which uh, which covered uh, almost a quarter of the sun's diameter. So it was huge; it just looped up and 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 out. And I think uh, Lisa Ann was able to to take a picture of it. So how do you, how do you get into um, solar observing and and imaging? Um, there are a, a number of options in terms of uh, entry level uh, instruments. Um, the one that uh, most people are familiar with is the uh, Coronado uh, Personal Solar Telescope. Uh, it has a 40 millimeter uh, objective and it's, it's an F10 instrument. Uh, a few years ago, Daystar 
uh, came out with uh, their Solar Scout, which is a 60 millimeter instrument at f15.5. Uh, and then just last year, Lunt uh, Instruments came out with their uh, uh, 40 millimeter uh, f10 uh, dedicated uh, solar scope. And uh, I, I wrote a review on this particular scope for Nova Notes uh, a while back. Um, of the three, it's currently the, the most um, economical. Uh, the other option uh, is the uh, Daystar Quark eyepiece. So this allows you to use your um, conventional uh, refractor uh, as a solar scope, uh, fitting uh, this particular instrument into the uh, diagonal and then, and then putting an, an eyepiece on top. So basically what the Quark um, eyepiece does is it, it takes what's oops, it takes the uh, business part of the uh, solar scout and condenses it in, into into one instrument um, so it's, it's certainly if you have a nice uh, apomatic uh, uh, refractor um, apochromatic refractor this is a, a nice way to uh, to uh, utilize that instrument for solar uh, observing and imaging. The only caveat being that uh, if you have a aperture uh, greater than 80 millimeters, you also need to purchase a pre-filter um, so that you don't uh, cook the insides of your of your telescope uh, when, you, when you're pointing it at the sun. Um, so about a thousand dollars will get you into the uh, um, solar observing and, and imaging uh, category. Um, and from there, it's almost the sky's the limit. Um, you can spend as much as $80,000 for a, uh, Lunt has a, a 300 uh, millimeter aperture F7 uh, solar telescope. Uh, so that's, uh, that's a, not just, not really pocket change. Uh, that's something that a, you know, a, a university might buy, I guess. Um, the average uh, solar instrument beyond entry level is going to run between um, $2,500 to $10,000, depending on uh, aperture. The price goes up as the uh, aperture goes up. So what can you, uh, can you see? This is a, a little better picture showing uh, the, the prominences, these, these uh, um, structures formed by uh, plasma that are, that are held up in, uh, by uh, tangled magnetic field lines. And, and these, the, the plasma then, as, as the field lines uh, vary in intensity, will fall back to the surface of the sun. Um, for point of view of comparison, this is the Earth. So you can see how large these, these prominences are. They would just swallow up the Earth and there are several um, Earth diameters uh, um, pointing out uh, from the uh, from the sun's surface. Uh, here's a filament. So this is a prominence viewed edge down, uh, sunspot, and uh, spicules, which, which are um, small structures at, at, the, at the very surface of the, uh, of the chromosphere. Uh, it looks like if you see them edge on, they, they look like a little, a little fuzzy layer. And, and it's very dynamic. This, the, uh, uh, structure of the spicules changes uh, over over minutes. So, what makes a solar telescope uh, uh, function? How how does it allow you to see hydrogen alpha light? Um, I've shown here a, a, because I'm most familiar with the Lunt 40 millimeter, uh, but all solar cel telescopes will have these uh, components. Uh, they just may be arranged a little bit differently. So first of all, there's a um, red glass pre-filter, which um, cuts out all of the uh, shorter uh, wavelength blue light and uh, uh, only, only allows the red light um, to pass through. Uh, beyond the pre-filter is a, a narrow band uh, Edelon filter. Uh, and then here in the, the diagonal, there's another filter called a blocking filter. The um, purpose of the ethylon filter and the blocking filter 
uh, is to remove uh, unwanted wavelengths of light bulb, amplify the desired wavelengths, the ones you want to see, by constructive interference. And uh, that's that's what makes these these instruments so expensive. Are, are these two uh, these two filters? You can um, adjust the uh, wavelength that reaches the eye or the camera sensor through several mechanisms. Um, the simplest is a mechanical tilting mechanism, um, and that's this little um, uh, uh, what's the I'm looking for. <laughs> yeah, screw knob, I guess, that uh, or thumb screw that puts pressure, mechanical pressure on the etalon and, and warps it slightly. And that causes different wavelengths of uh, the, the wavelength of light that's passing through the etalon filter to change a little bit. Uh, other ways of doing that are by uh, uh, pressure tuning and some of the uh, the other Lunt scopes uh, and the Coronado scopes use pressure tuning, uh, or uh, or electrical heating of the etalon and the Daystar instruments uh, all do all do this. Uh, the narrower the the filter uh, wavelengths are, the more off band light is uh, is rejected, and then therefore the contrast is is better. Um, a pass band of 0.7 to 0.5 angstroms will allow you to see prominences uh, as well as good surface detail. If the pass band goes up uh, beyond 0.9 angstroms, you can still see the prominences, but the surface detail will be poor because the contrast won't be very good. Um, you can add to many of these instruments a secondary uh, narrow band etalon filter. Uh, and that can be used to uh, further increase the contrast. Uh, so that's called a double stack system. So uh, if you you know if you've got a, a pass band in your single stack instrument of uh, um, 0.7 or 0.65 uh, angstroms, by adding another etalon filter, you can drop that down um, below uh, to 0.5 or or below. Um, uh, band pass. So you get a really, really good contrasty view. So equipment that you need for solar imaging, uh, obviously a hydrogen alpha solar filter or a quark eyepiece filter. Um, and uh, if you're using the quark eyepiece, uh, uh, you can use a refractor in the 60 to 80 millimeter aperture range uh, without purchasing a separate pre-filter. Uh, you need some sort of camera. Uh, so a DSLR that's able to take video uh, or a one-shot color astronomy camera or a mono astronomy camera. The uh, mono astronomy cameras are, are preferred for solar imaging because all the pixels are being used. Right? If, if you're using a one-shot color camera or a DSLR, um, you're only going to pick up um, the red light with the sensor and, and the, the Bayer pattern for most sensors is uh, um, red, uh, green, green, uh, blue. So you're, you're losing, you're not really using uh, three, uh, three quarters of your, of your sensor capacity. Whereas a mono um, astronomy camera will, will uh, uh, pick up, will use, use its uh, uh, pixels to pick up at all the, all the available light. Um, if you want to get close-up shots of uh, sunspots or prominence, uh, you might want to get a, two, a good two times Barlow. Uh, and depending on the camera, uh, you may need a focal reducer. I use a 0.5 uh, times focal reducer to give you whole disk images. And then lastly, you need a mount, uh, either a motorized alt azimuth mount or a motorized equatorial mount that's able uh, to uh, do solar tracking. Uh, because you're going to be taking um, you know, at least a thousand frames of, of video, and it's uh, ideally you want the uh, the, the uh, subject of your video to stay centered uh, in your in your uh, computer screen or view screen. Um, if you're just observing, you don't need the uh, motorized mount. Uh, any solid uh, tripod uh, will allow you to uh, 
to observe with, with any of those entry level uh, solar telescopes. And then you, if you're going to image, you need software. So you need uh, some sort of image capture software that's able to produce a, a SARE or AVI file. Um, I use uh, SharpCap, but there, there are other options available. Um, sometimes it's useful to um, use PIPP for preliminary processing of the data. Uh, if you've got a, a color image, you're using a one-shot color camera, you need to debayer um, that, uh, that data. And uh, if you've got drift of your um, object of interest across the screen, uh, it, uh, it helps to uh, um, center the image in, in the individual frames. And, and PIPP will do all of, all of that, as well as other things. And I'll get into that in a little bit later. Uh, then you need stacking software. Um, Auto stack or, or uh, API stack uh, are, are two options. Um, they're slightly different. Um, as you'll see later, I use auto stacker for still images, but uh, AVI stack uh, does a much better job if you're uh, producing the uh, time-lapse uh, videos. And then you need uh, some sort of image uh, processing software, um, IMPPG or Registax for, for sharpening, um, and uh, then Photoshop or GIMP for, for the final, uh, final touches, the, the tweaking of the final image. Um, I just want to mention IMPPG. This is a great piece of software. Um, all that software on the previous page, with the, the exception of uh, Photoshop, is, is free. Uh, so you can download it from, just do, Google the uh, software name, and you can find the site to download it from. Um, IMPPG is interesting because uh, I prefer it to Registax, particularly for solar imaging, um, because it uses deconvolution sharpening, um, which, which is not something Registax does. Uh, the sharpening that Registax does is, is uh, somewhat destructive. Um, the other nice thing about uh, IMPPG is it allows you to... Um, Make, make these changes in levels. Um, and this is very flexible. So you can bring up the detail in a prominence without, uh, without uh, losing uh, the detail in the um, much brighter uh, surface structure uh, simply by um, adjusting the shape of that curve. Uh, it, as I said, it uses deconvolution, Lucy Richardson deconvolution for sharpening. Uh, and there's uh, also uh, unsharp masking uh, integrated uh, into the program. So just to give you an idea of, of what IMPPG will, will do, um, this is a, a, a stacked image of a sunspot uh, and the filament uh, that uh, I cropped out of a whole disk image of the sun. And so this is before using IMPPG, and this is what it looks like after. And you can see the, the filaments uh, really popped out, uh, the, uh, the spicules and, and uh, uh, granulated nature of the surface of the sun is very obvious. Uh, you can see the sunspot and uh, plage uh, around the sunspot. So um, a great piece of software, and, and uh, I, I been told that it also works well for a lunar imaging, but I haven't uh, tried that yet. So just to give you my workflow um, for the different types of imaging, so uh, still images, these are uh, this is a whole disk image and, and some close-ups uh, that I've done. You need to start by capturing about a thousand to two thousand frames of a uh, of video. Um, now the sun rotates, so you don't want to uh, go too long or, or you'll get smearing uh, because of the, the rotation of the sun in the same way that uh, if you're imaging Jupiter, you, you don't want to go too long um, because of the rotation. Uh, if you're doing a close-up um, image, uh, it's also useful to uh, provide a, um, a flat frame. And the way you do that would be to, uh, you know, if, if you're imaging the sunspot, you'd move into the 
part of the sun, uh, you change your, uh, uh, move the field of view to a part of the sun where there's, where there's no structure, then you defocus and capture about 200 frames of uh, video to use to uh, construct a flat frame. Um, stack the best uh, 25 to 50% of the uh, resulting frames uh, using auto stacker. Uh, and inter and uh, in this process, you would use the master flat uh, for a close up. Um, then uh, take that resulting uh, TIFF file uh, into um, IMPPG, adjust levels of sharpness. And then if you're using a, a, a monochrome camera like I do uh, usually for solar imaging, uh, if you want to add color, you, you can do that quite uh, easily in Photoshop or GIMP and also tweak the, uh, the sharpness and, and the contrast uh, as well. Uh, the other thing you can do in, in solar imaging is to uh, create time-lapse images. And th these are really fun to create, but they're also pretty time-consuming and, and uh, um, requires that your, uh, your mount stay well-centered, your field of view stays well-centered on uh, the, uh, the object you're imaging. Uh, so here, I, this is, a, I think, a time-lapse of uh, over, either 60 to 90 uh, minutes showing the changes of, of in this prominence and also the activity around the sunspot and you can see this area here there it is uh, you can see so this is a uh, a prominence appearing uh, over that uh, over that sunspot um, so as i said you want to capture a video um, 10 seconds of video every uh, 60 to 90 seconds uh, for a period of, uh, of uh, up to uh, um, uh, an hour and a half or two hours. You could actually go longer. Um, these tend to use up a lot of hard drive space. So if you've got the, the capacity you, and, and you don't mind checking, making sure everything's centered properly, there's no drift, um, you could go for hours if you wanted. Uh, then I stack the best uh, 10 to 20% of frames uh, using um, A AVI stack. Um, AVI stack works better. It takes longer than, than uh, auto stacker to stack uh, images, uh, but it gives a better result for, for time lapse. And uh, once you do one, then you can use the same, same, the same, save the same settings and do a batch process. Uh, then uh, import those individual TIFFs. So you, if you've got uh, been taking 10 seconds every uh, minute and you've uh, gone for a minute, you've got 60 uh, files, 60 TIFFs following the stacking. Uh, so again, uh, once you um, decide on your optimal, uh, optimal settings for levels and sharpness, you can use IMPPG to batch process the, the, the remaining uh, images and then do final tweaks and colorize um, if desired um, using Photoshop or GIMP. Again, both those programs allow you to uh, batch process. So you can do all 60 files with the same settings. And then lastly, use PIP, I use PIPP uh, to select the region of interest and generate a, a, a GIF. Um, so that's, that gives you this, this animation running in a, uh, in a time, in a, uh, in a loop. So as I said, this is ac the activity you see over about 90 minutes, uh, looking at uh, this uh, prominence and this uh, sunspot. So that's, uh, the, uh, that's the end of my overview. Uh, here are some um, resources that are useful. Um, uh, NASA Solar Dynamics Laboratory, uh, the uh, Solar Hemispheric Observatory, and Space Weather. Uh, these sites all give uh, uh, current images of the sun uh, and uh, it'll allow you to see if there's something interesting happening uh, rather than uh, have making it worth your while to go and set up your equipment and, and capture uh, what you're looking what you want to look at 
uh, in terms of the um, uh, some of the techniques uh, and uh, uh, basics of, of solar observing and imaging. Uh, this article in, in Sky and Telescope by Bob King, the Observer's Guide to the H Alpha Sun, is, is uh, well worth uh, having a look at. And uh, there's a really nice um, um, PowerPoint presentation available online by Rupert Smith called Solar Imaging uh, an Introduction. And you can find that uh, on uh, astrograph.net. Uh, so um, with that, I'll end and uh, happy to answer any questions. Thanks, David. Um, there, uh, there was a comment from Lisa Ann. It says, fantastic program, David. I owe my curiosity about the sun to you specifically. Thanks for the guidance you've given me along the way. So. Yeah. Glad, glad to help, Lisa Ann. <laughs> <laughs> And, and I'm sure I, I enrich, enriched uh, some uh, telescope, solar telescope making company. <laughs> oh, there you go. <laughs> yeah, no, I always marvel at, at your photographs of, of solar ones in particular, just simply because I have no expertise or the ability to, to look at those. And some of your productions are absolutely amazing. The detail that you are able to bring out through your, uh, not only it, photo capture, but also your uh, processing afterwards. And that's with an, with entry level equipment. Um, I suspect my next purchase is going to be a uh, Quark, um, a Daystar, Daystar Quark eyepiece filter, uh, which will allow me to use one of my larger refractors to get even better resolution. Christmas wish list, perhaps? Yeah, probably a Christmas present for me. Yeah. <laughs> <To me. laughs> there you go. There you go. Okay, I'll uh, stop sharing. Great, thank you. Okay, yeah. given there are no further questions, uh, again, thank you so much, David, for that presentation. Um, up next is Pat Kelly. Uh, Pat is also a member of our board. He's our vice president currently. He has served many roles here in the center as well as on uh, at the national level. And today he's going to, and I have to read this, he's dealing with instability gap and cosmic distances. So he's gonna tell us a bit about unstable stars and how they help us establish um, widths and distances of our galaxy and, and others. So Pat, I will let you take it away. Okay, uh, let's get started. There, that should be up and running. Um, so I thought I'd, I'd talk about uh, an area of the HR diagram uh, that I'll explain in, in just a bit, um, which is an area where stars basically undergo technical difficulties and how this type of star was actually used to work out both the size of the Milky Way galaxy and then later on uh, determined that in fact there actually were other galaxies. So if you take a look at the Milky Way uh, in general, this is a, an all sky view of it, you've all seen it, it's been known since antiquity. Um, in ancient Greek, it was known as the Milky Way uh, because they thought that Zeus, who was a, the king of the gods, when he was a child, he was breastfeeding so strong that his mouth slipped off his mother's breast and the milk sprayed across the sky. And that was good enough for the Greeks. Uh, it was good enough for the Romans. The Romans kept it up. They called it the Via Lactea, which is Latin for Milky Way. Uh, and in fact, that's where lactose intolerant comes from. It comes from the Latin word, uh, which is the same word that they gave to the Milky Way. And that's where things really stood. Nobody really knew exactly what it was, other than the fact it was more or less straight and had areas in it where it looked like there were stars missing. And the first person, here, here's a, a typical view of it. And you have to remember that in early days, um, in fact, even up until the early 1900s, when people saw these dark areas, they thought they were dark because there were no stars there. So keep that in mind. It's going, it's going to sort of come up uh, a few times as we sort of go through this. So Galileo was the first person who actually uh, figured out exactly what it was. Uh, he used his crew telescope. He looked at the Milky Way and saw the Milky Way was actually composed of uncountable numbers of actual small faint stars. So it wasn't just some weird gassy thing. It wasn't milk. It was actually stars, but they were so far away it appeared to be so closely packed together that to the human eye, they just looked like this white band of light across the sky. And that's more or less where things stood um, until you get into the 1700s when Immanuel Kant, who was a German philosopher, uh, sort of took a look at it and he sort of noticed, it's one of those things that in hindsight, it's, it's glaringly obvious, 
but he noticed that if the Milky Way was made up of lots and lots of stars, there weren't very many stars looking away from the Milky Way. So therefore, the sun, as people were now thinking that the sun was a star, was in some sort of flattened arrangement of stars, some sort of disc-shaped thing with the sun being in the middle. And you can sort of see that idea from here. Uh, so if you actually have this area out here, so imagine this is sort of like a giant fried egg. Uh, we now know the fact our galaxy, it's two fried eggs glued back to back. So this bulge actually goes down below the disk as well. But out here where it's relatively flat, uh, if you look in any direction along the plane of the galaxy, you see lots and lots of stars, which is why we see the Milky Way. And if you look at a right angle straight up out of here, you basically see very few stars. You're basically just seeing the stars between where the sun is and the top of this disc-shaped structure. And in a wide field view, you can sort of see how that works. This is the view looking anywhere along the plane where there's lots and lots of stars. And you don't see many stars looking above the plane or below the plane. I mean, there's still lots of stars there, but you don't see the massed uh, Milky Way-like arrangement of stars you do tend to see when you're looking along the plane of the Milky Way. And in fact, this is looking towards Sagittarius. Uh, so this is the part of the Milky Way we see during the summertime. And that was more or less where things stood until 1784, uh, when William Herschel, who was a British astronomer, he decided to try and work out the actual shape of this disc-shaped thing in which the sun was supposedly uh, embedded. And he came up with a rather ingenious way of doing this. Uh, this is him with his telescope. Uh, I don't think that would pass any sort of safety standard these days, but that was what his telescope, uh, how it worked. Uh, it was basically, there was pulleys, so you used a rope to raise and lower this end of it. Uh, and then the whole thing was like on wheels, so you could roll it around, point in different directions. And then you climbed up this ladder thing and sat there and, and looked in. Uh, and in fact, his sister used to sit in the window over here of the house, and he would actually call in his observations and she would record them for him while he was up here risking life and limb in the name of science. So what he decided to do was to pick very small spots at random all across the sky, look at them in the telescope and count how many stars he saw. Now he made one assumption. The assumption was that stars on average are all the same distance apart. So if you saw twice as many stars in one little patch of sky than you did in the other, that meant that the stars extended twice as far in that direction. Now, at this point, one thing you have to keep in mind is that astronomers, even up until the early 1900s, were not aware of the fact that these, there were areas of dust in the galaxy that blocks the view of stars behind them. So they actually thought that areas where you saw no stars at all, such as, for example, the coal sack in the Southern Hemisphere or the dark dust lanes in the Milky Way that we now know is actually dust, they actually thought there were no stars there. So when Herschel did this little diagram, uh, he plugged it, came up with a three-dimensional model for it, and this is sort of a cross-section through his model. So here's the sun, and you can see that he has the sun more or less at the center of this collection of stars. Now, he had no idea how big it was because he had no idea how far apart the stars were, but you'll notice that when he's looking towards the Sagittarius direction, this is the look area looking above the dust lane, this is the area looking below the dust lane, and as I said, he just thought that the reason why he wasn't seeing very many stars where the dust lane was, was because there weren't very many stars there. And we now know, in fact, that there's lots and lots of stars. You just simply can't see them because there's nearby dust that blocks the view. And you can see the same effect happening here in the opposite direction. So these, these little areas that are, are coming in are areas where there's actually dust blocking the view of the stars behind them. So that was, that was Herschel's map. And it more or less put the sun at the center. And if you go into the early 1900s, uh, a Dutch astronomer by the name of Jacobus Captain, uh, he's probably most famous for discovering Captain's star. It's the second largest proper motion star after Barnard star. So it's a star that's actually quite close to us. Uh, he looked at the actual large scale motions of stars. And from that concluded that the sun was also more or less near the center of this collection of stuff. But there were a lot of people that thought that probably wasn't likely, mainly because we used to think that the Earth was the center of the solar system, and we found that it wasn't. And given how many stars there appeared to be, it seemed unlikely that the sun would be actually fairly close to the center. So it was one of these sort of, eh, well, we've been stung by this again, maybe we're not quite near the center of it. So 
one of the people who decided he was going to actually try and, and solve this problem once and for all uh, was Harlow Shapley. So in 1919, Harlow, Harlow Shapley uh, decided that what he was going to do was he was going to look at a particular type of object called a globular star cluster. Now, globular star clusters look like this. They're essentially big globs of stars. So they're sort of spherical in shape. Uh, so it's sort of like a giant swarm of bees, uh, very dense towards the center. Uh, and these objects are held together by their own gravity. So the stars out here orbit about the center of mass of the globular star cluster system. Now, why did he pick globular clusters, given that there's other types of things he could have picked? Well, he noticed that there was one thing that made the globular clusters different from every other type of object in the sky. For example, if you looked at where you saw planetary nebulas, for example, they were always found in the, near the Milky Way. If you look at open clusters, they're always found near the Milky Way. If you look at spiral nebulas, they're always found away from the Milky Way. But globular clusters were actually found predominantly on one side of the sky. So I'll show you how that sort of works. So here we have the Milky Way with a whole bunch of stars. Um, here's the bounds of the Milky Way, or at least the conventional bounds of where the Milky Way is found. And I'm going to throw in, uh, there's the large Magellanic clouds, the two little ones down the southern hemisphere. I'm going to throw in the globular clusters. So this is towards Sagittarius in the middle, and this is towards Orion out here at the, in the opposite direction. And I'm going to take away everything. I'm going to take away the stars. And you'll notice that the globular clusters are all in one part of the sky. They're not randomly distributed all over the place. They're not found only in the plane of the galaxy, and they're not found only away from the plane of the galaxy. So he sort of thought that there must be something special about these objects and why this might be a good idea to try and find out what the actual shape of the galaxy is. Because what he figured was that if these objects were arranged in three dimensions around some center, off in this direction, chances are everything in the galaxy was arranged around the center of whatever the globular clusters were arranged around the center of. So this was the idea. If you can't really see all the way in this direction, but you can see up over here, you've got a much better chance of figuring out exactly what the distribution is. So that's why you picked the globular clusters. You thought, well, the center's off here, but the only thing that's asymmetrically distributed are the globular clusters. So I'm going to use the globular clusters and assume that the center of this distribution is, in fact, the center of the galaxy. So that's what he did. Now, the problem that he ran into was he had no idea what the distances were to the globular clusters. He knew which direction they were because you could plot on a star chart so that from the sun's position, this is the direction you go to them. But he had to figure out exactly how far out they were. And how do you do that? Well, that's where we come with the idea of a standard candle. Standard candles are very useful in astronomy. A standard candle is basically an object, a celestial object, whose true luminosity is the same regardless of where you see it. So for example, I'll give you an example of, of, a, of a fairly common one, uh, a standard 100 watt light bulb. If you take a standard 100 watt light bulb, it's going to give off 100 watts. It's going to be the same brightness regardless of how close it is to you or how far away it is from you. What's going to determine how bright it appears to you is basically its distance from you. So a standard candle in astronomy is something where the actual luminosity of it is consistent from one of these objects to another object to another object to another object. So what can you use for standard candles? Well, here's a standard HR diagram. So Hertzsprung and Russell uh, both came up with this way of plotting the positions of stars where you plot uh, across the top their temperature or spectral type. They're, they both stand in for the same thing. And then on this axis, you plot their luminosity uh, or their absolute magnitude. They're again, both measures for the exact same thing. And you can see that on this diagram, the sun, this is measured in solar luminosities. The sun has a luminosity of one solar luminosity, which puts it right there. And it's a spectral type G2 star. So the spectral types are alphabetized. Um, there's a history as to why the order is scrambled, but essentially each of them has nine categories. So there's A0, A1, A2, A3, A4, up to A9, 
then F0, F1, F2, F9, G0, G1, and so on. And the sun's spectral type is G2. Now ignore all the crap out here and ignore all the crap out here. Most stars spend almost all their time on the main sequence. And the main sequence basically is a, a diagram that sort of shows you where stars are during their normal lifetime and what determines where on the main sequence a star ends up is very simple. It's determined by the star's mass. So as you move up the main sequence, you go from dim to bright. Remember, these are really luminous stars up here. These ones up here are 10 to the 6. This is a million times brighter than the sun. So as you go up the main sequence, the stars get more luminous. Their surface temperature also increases as you go up the main sequence. And as it turns out, if you, if you were to plot the sizes on here, you'd find that the areas of equal size run at an angle like this. They get bigger as they go up here. And the mass also increases. So if you know the mass of a star, when it's formed, that mass determines exactly where it is here on the main sequence. So the sun is where it is on this diagram because it has one solar mass of material. These stars down here have masses less than the sun, and these stars up here have masses greater than the sun. Now, the one thing that this type of diagram doesn't really show well is the fact that when it comes to star formation, you get a lot of really faint stars down here for every couple of stars you get in this area, for every one or two stars you get up here. So these stars up here that are really, really hot at their surface and really, really luminous are very scarce. There's not a lot of them around. So the chances of you actually finding one of these in a place where you want to look at a cluster, for example, is relatively small. So these things don't really make good standard candles for what he was looking for. And this distribution is sort of, it, it happens all over, all through natural things. Uh, there's not very many blue whales, but there's lots and lots of herring, uh, at least until we came along and scooped them all up. But in most natural systems, you get very few really big things. And as you go down inside, you get more and more and more and more of them. So that's what this diagram is, is sort of designed to show you. So how does an actual one of these things work? Well, a type of star that is really good to use for a standard candle is an A0 star. And Vega, which is one of the bright stars in the Summer Triangle, happens to be an A0 type star. Now, the reason why these ones are good ones to use is because there's a fairly large number of them. And they're also quite bright. They're about 100 times as bright as the sun is. So you can see these stars across a very great distance. So how does a standard candle work? Well, the brightness of anything falls off with the inverse square of your distance from it. So if you have a star here and you go to a certain distance on this sphere, you're going to get a certain amount of uh, radiation falling per square meter. If you go twice as far, that light is spread out over four times the area. So now each square meter of it gets one quarter of what it originally got. If you go three times, it's spread over nine times the area. So each square meter of it gets one ninth. So there's a very simple relationship between how far out you are away from something and how bright it appears. So the way that a standard candle works is let's say, say you have the sun and you have an A0 star. And this star is close enough that you can use standard parallax to measure the distance to it. So parallax is, is, is just based on trigonometry. You look at the star from each side of the sun's orbit or the Earth's orbit around the sun, and by measuring the angle of change in the sky, it's, it's just basically simple trig. Uh, you can do this in grade 10. Uh, the math is not very complicated. And you do your trigonometry on it, and you discover that this candle, or this standard object, is 20 parsecs away. So now you see another A0 star that's fainter than the one to whom you know the distance. And in fact, when you measure the brightness of it, you find that this new star is exactly three times dimmer than the first star. Now remember the inverse square relationship. If it's nine times dimmer, that means it has to be three times farther away. So you take the square root of nine, gives you three. So it's three times farther away than the first star is, and three times 20 is 60 parsecs. So that's what a standard candle is. If you can measure the distance to one of these types of objects, regardless of what it is, then if you ever see that object anywhere else in the universe and it's fainter, 
you simply take how much dimmer it is, take the square root, and it's got to be that number of times farther away than the one to whom you know the distance, and you work out the distance to it. So this works really well for nearby stars. So you might think at first glance, well, we'll just go out and we'll do the same sort of thing in real life. So, but the problem with these stars is they're only 100 times brighter than the sun, which is good. Uh, but the problem is, how do you tell you've got an A0 star? Well, this is how you know you've got an A0 star. You have to take the light from the star, spread it through a prism, and then examine the spectral lines. So here's one similar to the sun. This shows the G0 and the G5. So the sun spectral lines are like this, but you can see that they're slightly different for every single spectral type. So to know that you really have an A0 star, you've got to take the light, spread it out, which makes it really, really faint. And then if it's really, really faint, use a really, really long exposure on photographic film, which is what they were doing back in those days. And then you can study the lines and see if you actually do have an A0 star or not. And as you can see, the, they are slight, there are subtle differences between these. So the problem with the, the Chapley was facing was, okay, no problem at all. We'll simply take a look at, at the stars in a globular cluster. We'll find the A0 stars, spread them out. Uh, no, that doesn't work because with the technology he had, it would have been incredibly difficult to do this. So what you need is another type of standard candle. And fortunately, there is such a beast. There's two of them, well, two related ones. Stars that are on the main sequence tend to be in a balance. So at every point in the star, the energy production coming out pushes against gravity and they're perfectly balanced. Now, as you go further and further inside the star, the gravity pushing in gets higher and higher and higher because you've got the weight of more and more material on it. But the energy production, the energy pouring out of the core is also higher because you're closer to the core. So it's got a smaller area through which to go and everything is balanced all the way down. So stars that are on the main sequence, and this is what the sun is doing right now, are in a nice balance between the energy they produce at the core and gravity pulling them in, and they just sit there. Now, as, as we saw in the previous presentation, there's lots of neat stuff happening at the very surface, but for the bulk of the star, it's in balance. Now, stars have thermostats. The rate at which energy is produced in the center of the star is incredibly sensitive to the temperature. So let's say that the sun suddenly starts producing a slight more energy than it should. So there's a rise in the core temperature. The temperature in the star increases, the fusion rate increases, and as the energy production increases, the core starts to expand because now it's able to push out against gravity. And as it expands, it cools off because an expanding gas cools off and it goes back to equilibrium again. The same thing happens if for some reason, the rate of energy production starts to slow down. In that case, gravity says, aha, I'm gonna win now. And it starts to compress the inner parts of the star again. Compressing the gas increases the temperature and increase the temperature increases the rate of energy production and it goes back to normal. So in stars like the sun or all the stars on the main sequence, they have a way of dealing with any changes in the energy production inside the actual core of the star. Now, the problem with stars is they don't stay on the main sequence. When they're formed, you can plot where they move around on the main sequence or on an HR diagram and what's called an evolutionary track. So stars come in from the right-hand side they end up on the main sequence based on their mass. And then as they start to run out of fuel in their central core, they start running into problems and they start moving away from the main sequence and they start to wander around on the HR diagram. So this is a little animation that shows the sun, uh, the sun's entire lifetime in a very short period of time. So it comes in, you notice it's much, much larger or, or hotter than the sun is now. And if, okay, so they were on the main sequence. And essentially not a lot's going to happen. And this is for both stars, it's typically 80 to 90% of their life is spent just moving around very slowly. Then things get unstable in the core, they start to move around. 
uh, sits on the horizontal branch, poof, planetary nebula, and becomes the white dwarf, and that's the end of the sun. So as stars start to move around on the HR diagram, what can happen with them is they can end up in an area known as the instability strip. So here we have a diagram that sort of shows stars. So here again, we have luminosity. So one times the sun's luminosity. The sun is a G2. So the sun would be right about here on this diagram. 100 times the sun's luminosity, 10,000 times the sun's luminosity. And this one also shows you the sizes of stars. So this one is one tenth the size of the sun, anything along this line. Anything along this line is exactly the same size as the sun. So that's why we know we can put the sun right about there. And then as you move up here, these stars up here are 10 times the size of the sun. And these ones up here are 100 times the size of the sun. And stars that move into this area known as the instability strip experience technical difficulties with their thermostats. They widely swing back and forth between too much energy, not enough, too much energy, not enough. And what that means is that they change their brightness with a very regular pattern as they change in both color and change in size. And there's two main, there's two types of stars in here. There's the so-called RR Lyrae variable stars. These are stars that have about the same mass as the sun or less. So they're, they're older stars of the sun. So they've long since gone through that process where they're going to start moving off the main sequence. And they move into this inst instability strip area. And they're called RR Lyrae stars because the very first one of these stars was discovered was the star RR Lyrae. So astronomers being rather original when it comes to naming things, that's what they're called. They're called RR Lyrae variable stars. And you'll notice that one of the neat things about these stars is they're quite bright. They're about 100 times brighter than the sun. So you can see them across very large distances. More massive stars end up in this area up here. They wander further away from the main sequence as they start to move around. And these are called Cepheid variables because the first one of these stars that was discovered was Delta Cepheus, Cephei. Delta Cephei, the constellation of Cepheus. And these stars up here also go through this pulsation as they get bigger and smaller and change their actual brightness. Now, if you take a look at these stars, what you discover is there's another big difference between them. Our, our Leary variable stars, oddly enough, because they're very old stars, are found in globular clusters, which is what Shapley was looking for. And in fact, in early textbooks, uh, if you look at textbooks from the 20s or the 30s, um, these are all, they were often called cluster variables because they are found almost exclusively in globular clusters. And notice that the time it takes them to go through the cycle is actually quite short. Uh, a day is, uh, is a really long one. So these go through this change in brightness really, really quickly. And with Cepheid variable stars, uh, they tend to take a lot longer, in some cases up to three months to go through a cycle. And generally the reason for this is that they're more massive. So there's a lot more, uh, it takes a lot longer for them to go through these pulsations. And you can see that for some of these Cepheid variable stars, they are incredibly bright. So you can see these across very, very large distances. So these are the guys that Chapley was actually interested in looking for. So this is what the brightness of, the, of a early array variable star does. In fact, it almost looks like a human heartbeat. Uh, it has a very sharp pulse where it goes up by about one magnitude in brightness and a little bump. And it's very, very regular. So you can see in this case, uh, this pattern repeats about every 0.4 days which is less than 12 hours, say eight or nine hours. So every eight or nine hours, it goes up, makes this little brightness spike. And it's almost a full magnitude. You can actually notice that a change of one magnitude with your eye. You don't even need sophisticated instruments to see these stars when they're doing their thing. Uh, with Cepheid variable stars, they take longer and they have a different shape of their curve. They rise in brightness really quickly this is the curve actually for Delta Cepheid, the one that they were actually named after. Uh, they rise very quickly, and then they gradually get dimmer. And then they rise quickly and gradually get dimmer. And again, if you look at the change in magnitude, it's about one magnitude. And Delta Cepheid uh, ranges from about 4.5 to 3.5. So when it's at its brightest, it's actually a relatively bright star. And you can actually go out and watch this star change its brightness over the course of its period, because like I said, one make two change in brightness is actually quite easily noticeable. So 
So I actually finally was able to track down an animation that sort of shows you why these stars go through this brightness change. So this is from the European Space Agency. And this is going to show you a Cepheid variable as opposed to an Arleary variable star. Uh, so what you're going to see is, is the first part here is, is, is kind of boring. This is a normal star. So this is what a star would normally look like on the main sequence when everything is working properly in it. Now the change over from a normal star to a Cepheid variable star is very, very gradual. Uh, it doesn't happen in 10 seconds like they're showing here. Uh, but the star moves off the main sequence and now you can see what happens. It starts pulsating. So it not only changes color and the, the whiter it is, the hotter the surface is, it changes size. And it's this pulsation that causes the one magnitude change in its brightness. So when you see one of these things, uh, they're very easy to recognize because of that distinct pattern they have of brightening and dimming. Okay, so all that Chapley had to do was look at globular clusters, find some of our early ray variable stars, and then get on with the work of actually using how dim they appear compared to ones that we that are, are fairly close by to work out how far away they are. Now this is M55. Those three stars that have arrows pointed at them are, are early ray variable stars. Now, that's not very exciting. You, I could, you know, you could put arrows on any stars in there and said that they were our Larry, Larry variable stars, and you would have no reason to disbelieve me. So I tracked down an actual movie of a globular cluster, actually showing the our Larry variable stars. So this is part of M3, and I'm going to start it playing, and you should have no trouble at all detecting the our Larry variable stars. They're the ones that look like Christmas lights. And they're all changing by about one magnitude in brightness for the very short period because our earlier variable stars have this really short period. So Chapman was all set. What he ended up doing uh, was he did all the work. He use the our early ray variable stars to work out the distance. And he determined that in three dimensions, the globular clusters are centered around a point that's about 15,000 parsecs away from the sun in the direction of Sagittarius. Now the currently accepted value for that distance is more like 8,000 parsecs. So your first thought would be how on earth could he have screwed it up enough that he got a distance over twice what it actually is. Well, the main reason for that is this problem with the dust. He was assuming that there was no dust anywhere along his line of sight. So here's the sun. Here's a line pointing at this globular cluster. You find some R early ray variable stars in it. You then are able to work out the distance to it. So you know where it is in three dimensions. And by measuring the angle from one side to the other and knowing the distance, you can actually work out physically how big that cluster is from one side to the other. That's also very simple geometry. The problem was, is when he was looking near the plane of the ecliptic, there's dust in here. And what the dust did was it made the our, our variable stars look dimmer than they actually were, which meant he thought they were much further away than they actually were. And when you move it much further away than it actually is, that means you also think it's a lot bigger than it actually is. And in fact, Shapley was actually quite concerned about this because when he actually finally got all of the results, he thought it was really, really weird that by far all the really big globular clusters were almost exactly opposite the sun, looking through the plane here where there's lots of dust. And he thought that that can't be right. There's no reason why all the big globular clusters should, for some reason, just be exactly opposite where I happen to be looking from. So once you correct it for the dust, you get the value that's sort of uh, right. And that's sort of what we actually know today as the current size of the galaxy. So this is the direction towards Sagittarius. And this is also one of these areas where, in retrospect, it's pretty bloody obvious that if this thing has a center, it's going to be in this direction where there's lots and lots and lots of stuff as opposed to over here where there's hardly anything at all. 
But Shapley was the one who actually proved that, in fact, it was actually in that direction. And that's why we now know that the galaxy is about, we're about 8,000 parsecs from the center. And that the center, this area around here where all these globular clusters are, are centered on the center of the galaxy. So that established that, once again, humans were not at the center where we thought that we were. Now, shortly after this, there was another, this, the almost exact same technique was done to solve another question. And that question was, what exactly are these things? This is the Whirlpool galaxy. A lot of people thought that they were actually gas clouds. So they were nebulas. In fact, I've got a really old book from the late 1800s that calls this object the Andromeda Nebula because it was thought to be just a gas cloud. And again, there were people around this after Shapley that were thinking, well, maybe these things aren't actually gas clouds after all, because there's one thing that's rather weird. If these are gas clouds, and people thought what they were actually seeing uh, was planets in the process of forming. So they thought these were solar systems that were actually using the theories that were developed by uh, Le Verrier and Kant using Newton's laws show that yes, you can have a big cloud of gas and it'll flatten out and form a star at the center and you get planets forming out of the disk that comes around it. Uh, people said, well, you know, there's, there's one problem here. And that problem is if this is where stars come from and almost all the stars in our galaxy are in the plane where the galaxy is, why is it the only place we see these is everywhere except where the plane of the galaxy is? We only see this when we're looking away from it. So some people thought these were actually clouds of stars. And the term that they used for them, which, are, which I really like, they call them island universes. The, the term galaxy had, had really come into vogue for these things. They, they, so there was a big speculation as to whether or not there were island universes or not. And there was a big debate called the Shapley-Curtis debate uh, to try and resolve this argument once and for all that didn't actually settle anything. And in 1923, Edwin Hubble resolved the problem once and for all. And he did it using the biggest telescope in the world at the time, which was the 100-inch Hooker Telescope in California. So that's a really big telescope. And he did it by taking photographs of the outer areas of the Andromeda Nebula. And he resolved it into individual stars. And he took pictures over day after day after day and discovered as you can see in this digital recreation, this is using a modern telescope. This is actually not Andromeda, this is M101, I believe it is, M100. This is using a digital camera, but out here in the outskirts where you can actually see individual stars, this star is changing its brightness. And it's changing its brightness just like a Cepheid variable star. And apparently I put that one in twice. So by knowing how bright this thing actually is and knowing how far away these things actually had to be, rather than being little gas clouds inside our own galaxy, he actually was able to compute that the Andromeda galaxy, as, as it's now called, was in fact 20 Milky Way diameters away from the Milky Way galaxy. So it was a completely different thing and therefore all these spiral nebulas were in fact other galaxies. And all because of these stars, that happened to lie in that little weird part of the HR diagram called the instability strip. So that is that is the end. Thanks, Pat. There haven't been any questions to date uh, come through on the chat, but if people would like to add them or would like to unmute themselves and address Pat directly, please do so. I kind of figure it's, it's it's relatively straightforward. It's just in a lot of cases people just aren't aware of the uh, of the actual process that that uh, that had to go through. And in fact, uh, in the Curtis Shapley debate on the nature of these island universes, Shapley uh, argued that in fact they were not island universes; that they were in fact uh, local gas clouds. So he got the size of the galaxy right, but he got the idea of what universes uh, island universes were wrong. And it was Hubble that actually sort of straightened that whole mess out. Hello. Pat? <laughs> Pat? Yeah. That was a magnificent presentation. Um, that's a big story to tell in a short amount of time. And I've never seen it done quite like that. So that was really wonderful. Thank you.
Oh, well, you're welcome. I, I, I was going to put in the whole thing about how they work out the period luminosity relationship for the Cepheid variable stars, but uh, given that it's a relatively nice afternoon, and I figured I'd try and keep the, the, court, the talk to about half an hour, give or take. Well, uh, that was a masterful job. Thank you. Oh, I'm glad you liked it. Okay, well, there's nothing come through on the uh, the chat, Pat. So thank you so much for that. Um, You're that welcome. Explained, explains a lot, and I learned a little bit more about Cepheids as well. So that's kind of cool. Thank you. And uh, there's comments from Bob Russell who says, "Great, Pat. I now understand why and he puts that in big caps. Variables are uh, and how they work. A fundamental level, greatly appreciated." And you've got um, thank yous and fascinating talks. So thanks again, Pat. Oh. Okay, next up on our agenda is our monthly installment of What's Up in the Night Sky. And to do so is our observing chair, uh, Dave Chapman, who's been a member of our board for many years, has various roles um, nationally and provincially. And so Dave, I will let you tell us what's up in October. You're muted, dear. Thanks, honey. <laughs> um, <laughs> um, Judy and I are going camping on Monday. With our partners, let's specify this. <laughs> oh, come on, you spoiled the fun. I <laughs> uh, hope you can all see my title slide and hear me okay. Okay, thank you very much. What's up for this month? Um, just like to mention uh, this uh, photograph, which is the backdrop for my slide, is a picture taken by me um, from Kejim Kujing National Park the last time I was there, which was not that long ago. And the place we're going this uh, on Monday uh, to do some camping and observing is the same spot. So, and it's a it's the dark of the moon. So we're hoping to have uh, some nice views of the sky. So we'll be doing some observing and some imaging. So we'll have some interesting stories, I think, uh, when we get back. This picture is the Milky Way going through the Summer Triangle. Can you see the cursor on my screen, or is that just me that can see that? that looks so looks here, good. So up here is uh, Deneb in the constellation of Cygnus. And down here is uh, Altair in the co co constellation Aquila. Over here on the, oops, where to go? Over here is the constellation Delphinus, by the way. Uh, and up here is uh, Vega, which is in Lyra. And uh, uh, I like to tell people this is the constellation Dave. D for Deneb, A for Aquila, and V E for Vega. And Vega gets two letters because of the double double in Lyra. So, and I would go further to say if Quinn was around, he'd say there's a, a ring nebula here in Lyra, which looks like a donut. And so uh, we, he was thinking that, oops, he was thinking that we, we could go to Tim Hortons and say, well, we've got a constellation with a donut and a double double. So if you give us enough money, we'll name the constellation after Tim Horton. So anyway, we didn't get very far with that project. Um, while we're looking for things in this picture, uh, you can actually see the coat hanger star cluster in here. I don't know. I can see it. I don't know. Can you guys see it? The coat hangers there. Oh, boy. Um, anyway, there's uh, lots of stuff to see in the sky, even though it's fall. Uh, the summer triangle is still um, very evident in the sky, and the reason is the later it gets in fall, the earlier the sky gets dark. So it, it almost seems like the if you observe, you know, as soon as it gets dark, it's almost like the sky stops or slows down a lot uh, in the fall uh, because of that. Because uh, even though the constellations are continually disappearing in the west, uh, because it gets darker earlier at night, you get to see it earlier. So it's kind of a neat feature of the fall sky is that it almost freezes there for a few weeks. Okay, what's up this month? As always, uh, any underlined uh, text in this uh, presentation is actually an active hyperlink. 
And uh, if you go to the um, RESC webpage, this uh, presentation is available in PDF form and the, the links there are active as well. So if you want to go back and follow up any of those links uh, after the uh, presentation today, uh, they'll be there for the next month. So you can always go back and uh, check that out. Now, um, the sun this month. Uh, uh, as I said, it's getting uh, darker earlier. Um, through the month of October, things aren't changing as fast as they did in September. In September, we had the we had the uh, uh, equinox, and around the equinox, the length of day and night changes very dramatically from beginning of the month to the end of the month. This isn't so dramatic, as you can see from the little pie charts underneath. Um, the sunset is getting earlier and uh dusk end is getting earlier like so now you can get out at 8 30 or you know and and eventually like 7 30 and start observing uh unlike the summertime where we had to wait till almost midnight uh so we're getting increasing a number of hours of darkness uh dawn is uh uh you know pr pretty late sunrise is late and that's partly because we're still under daylight saving time That'll all, that'll all jump uh, an hour in, in next month in November. And uh, uh, don't get me started about this idea of going on permanent daylight saving time. Uh, the, this idea has been raised. Uh, I don't think the people understand what would happen in the middle of winter in the morning, how dark it will be. So there I got myself started. Uh, <laughs> um, the noon is uh, around one o'clock. Uh, that one hour shift is because of daylight saving time. The few minutes more or less, you might wonder why noon wouldn't be right at the top of the hour, but that is because the, the sun in going around the ecliptic, it doesn't go at a constant rate uh, because of the um, eccentricity of the Earth's orbit. And so you have this extra little bit of, you know, few minutes here, a few minutes there. Uh, and that's called the equation of time. It's in the handbook. I can't remember the exact page, but if you're interested in that, it's it's one of the corrections you have to make for a, a sundial if you use a sundial. And the amount of sundial, sunlight is going down, uh, and the, the, the altitude of the sun at noon is dropping. Um, so I always use uh, 10 hours of sunlight as the... Uh, uh, the end of when you can sort of grow things outdoors. Uh, plant growth basically stops at about 10 hours. So by the end of October, uh, things aren't growing too much, with some exceptions. So if you want to follow the solar activity, I mean, uh, uh, D David Hoskin keeps up uh, keeps us up pretty uh, pretty up to date on what's going on with the sun. But you can go any day of any day you can go to that link and see what's going up um, uh, happening lately and the sun is getting more active as he was mentioning where you know the solar cycle 25 is seems does seem to be getting going finally okay oh boy the moon um the moon uh the face of the moon actually unlike most times uh, actually almost uh, you know uh, matches the the month this this uh, this time so the new moon's coming up as i said on the 6th of october and the current uh, moon uh, moon period is going to finish right now we're in wigum gewigus which um, which is the mate calling moon time and then we go into the animal fattening time, which is we gay we goose. Sounds a lot. It sounds similar, but uh, it's not. So it's the animal fattening time uh, to the Mi'kmaq. And that starts, uh, I'm going to say on the, uh, I don't know if we're going to be able to see the, uh, the uh, crescent moon on the 7th. That'll be interesting to look for. Uh, we'll be out there on site 15 and uh, yeah, that'll be fun, right? Um, 
the f first quarter is on October 12th into 13th, uh, the night of the 12th, 13th. Uh, the, following, the following few nights, the, the moon uh, passes by Saturn and Jupiter. And uh, I'll show you a picture of that later. It never, f from our time zone, it never gets really close to either of them. Um, the full moon is on the 20th of October. Uh, and that's still animal fattening time. And the last quarter, quarter, sorry, is a quarter. I'm, sorry, I'm getting to sound like Lisa. Anyway, <laughs> October 28th uh, is the last quarter. But of course, you'd, you'd have to get up in the morning to see that, not in the evening. Uh, now, there's one thing I did want to mention that Saturday, October the 16th is, in fact, International Observe the Moon Night. Uh, we've often done... Uh, outreach programs on on that night and uh, I sort of decided a while back that we weren't going to plan anything because of COVID. We haven't been doing any public uh, observing and it just complicates matters. So I haven't planned anything uh, but uh, it is coming up on the 16th and who knows what sort of situation we're going to be in in terms of restrictions and, and whatnot and gathering. I just wanted to bring it to your attention in case anybody wanted to kind of do a, maybe they want to do a, like a, a driveway type like uh, activity for their friends and neighbors, but I'll leave that up to the individual. Uh, we're not going to organize anything uh, formal. If you go to the site, uh, there are some, um, there are some pr um, resources like uh, cool moon maps of things to look for on the night. Now that, That'll be a gibbous moon. They always choose a gibbous moon for some reason. Um, uh, uh, so um, you can go and see the moon maps they have arranged. Um, I, at this point in the program, I always uh, try to get people doing um, beginner lunar observing. Now there are three, essentially three kind of beginner level programs in the RESC for the moon. Uh, the, the very basic level is the moon segment in um, Explore the Universe, which is the, this is the map for that. It, it, there's 12 craters and 12 mare or, or seas. And uh, yeah, these are all uh, selected that you can observe them pretty easily with binoculars. Uh, but when I say that, I think some people have, might have a hard time holding binoculars steady to see some of these details. So I recommend that you figure out some way to steady them. Uh, there's a bunch of different ideas. You can use a, a binocular or a tripod. Um, you can actually rig up something with just a pole just to take the weight off the binoculars and you can still sort of hand hold them. But if you, if you sort of rest like a broomstick or something on the ground, you can, you can fashion different things to help steady the binocular for moon observing. Uh, and then the, the most uh, the most expensive way is to buy image stabilized binoculars, which are amazing but cost a lot of money. Uh, but you you can do binocular observing of the moon. Uh, so I always tell beginners if you've never done this before, um, you you can observe the moon most any night, as long as you're willing to you know situate yourself and, and get up at, uh, you know be be outside at the right time. Um, but uh, for beginners, if you just want to give it a go, um, I always suggest around the time of the first quarter. And in this case, that's between uh, October 11th to 14th. So that's kind of, um, uh, I guess that's Thanksgiving Day and the days after. And the reason I say that is because uh, when, when the sun sets, and, the, and you see the moon in the sky, it's usually very well placed in the evening sky. It's probably going to be the highest up in the sky at that time. Uh, you can go outside and, you know, it, at a civilized hour and do some observing. So, uh, like I say, you can observe anytime, pretty much. But uh, if you're just getting started, that's a nice time to try in that, in that uh, uh, period of time. And uh, you will see that the terminator, which is the line between night and dark on the moon, will move across that area, which is the green oval. And so you'll be able to see quite a number of the features that are in Explore the Universe. I mean, you'd be able to, 
identify the seas just about any any phase of the moon uh, but uh, it's it's best to look near the terminator if you want the craters and so on to stand out in relief sometimes when the sun gets overhead uh, on the moon uh, the features wash out a bit and you can't pick them out as well so if you want to get started uh, observing the moon um, you know try to try to see if you can pick out three each of, from that list um, speaking of uh, observing the moon and uh, and uh, challenges um, I, w I want to do a little uh, shout out here to Lisa Ann Fanning uh, this isn't this this isn't in the online uh, version of this talk I only put this in uh, yesterday uh, but uh, Lisa Ann um, uh, she's gotten into astronomy and she's gotten in, uh, into lunar observing. Uh, she's got herself a nice telescope and, and she's, uh, she's really adept at uh, sort of using her iPhone to image at the eyepiece. I think she might have picked this up from birding, but uh, she's been putting, putting together some nice images uh, of the moon and other things. Anyway, the first picture she took uh, back on September 14th and she said, "Look, I, you know, I saw the Great Wall in the in the, in on the moon, the the Straight Wall. Um, sorry. And uh, so this is a feature uh, which is comparable to North Mountain in uh, in Nova Scotia, sort of the length of the Annapolis Valley, and I think the height might be about the same. Um, and uh, anyway, she was quite proud of herself that she got this picture. And I said, "Well done." I said, "But if you really want to get extra points for this." Go back in two weeks and catch it from from the other side when the sun's coming from the other direction because it looks much different. So in the first picture, which I believe is inverted, uh, the sun is coming from the left-hand side, which is the eastern limb of the moon. And so it, it casts a shadow at the straight wall. So you have to imagine it's, it's like a, a ledge or a cliff, right? It's not like a mountain range that sticks up. It, there's a cliff and then it drops down and then you get a shadow. And you can see the shadows from the surrounding craters. Two weeks later, the sun's way on the other side and you have to get up in the morning. So she, it, it really cost her to do this. Uh, she got up in the morning. Now the sun's coming from the right-hand side, which is the, the western disk. And you can see all the shadows are shooting the other way. And now what you see is the straight wall, the same straight wall as before, but now it's being, the face of it is being illuminated by the sun. And uh, I think this is a really cool uh, pair of pictures. I really like it and I wanted to share that and, uh, and give some credit there to Lisa for the, uh, her, not only her technical uh, expertise uh, at creating this image, but also for her great dedication in doing this you know making herself get out of bed at 3 30. i don't know why it took her an hour and 10 minutes you know I, she's probably got some story but you know she she was crying the blues about how she had to get up at 3 30. but uh, i'll give her credit for that because uh, like i always say astronomers observe when they must and they sleep when they can dave she claims it was and she puts this all in caps clouds it was clouds. Oh, she wanted to do it earlier. Oh, I see. Well, I'm more of a just in time kind of guy. So <laughs> <laughs> I, I don't think I would have been out there at 3.30. But, uh, you know, Lisa, you, 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 you pat yourself on the back there. You've, you've done a good job and, and you're, a, you're a great inspiration to everyone. Uh, so the planets are pretty interesting this month. Um, Mercury is too close to the sun uh, in early October. Uh, however, it's a pretty fast moving planet. It's mercurial. <laughs> and by the time that the end of the month rolls around, it's in the morning sky and uh, at an eastern elongation, greatest elongation west, which the west of the sun means it's in the morning sky and, and, uh, you look to the east. It's always, it always even I have to think about that. Uh, but this is the best morning apparition for observers in the northern hemisphere. Uh, um, and it will also be near the waning crescent moon on November the 3rd. 
there might be a bit of a challenge to that. But for those early risers, Lisa, maybe, Dave Hoskin, I think, does things like this. Me, that uh, might be an interesting photo opportunity. Uh, Venus is brilliant, uh, but it's very low in, in the western sky, evening sky. It has a greatest elongation east in the western sky in the evening on October 29th. But unlike Mercury, it's very poorly placed. Uh, and it's it, uh, it will appear um, less than five degrees below the crescent moon uh, during dusk on October 9th. But the autumn crescent moons are already low in the sky and the Venus is five degrees below that. So that could be tricky. Um, and uh, the apparitions of Venus go through uh, an eight-year cycle, and so this this particular apparition is is uh, one that comes back. It, it's one of the ones where the evening uh, the evening apparition is not well placed for northern hemisphere observers. Great if you were in the southern hemisphere. Mars is simply too close to the sun, uh, and when it's not too close to the sun, it'll be in the morning sky. Uh, but it's it's it's. Um, working its way around to an opposition in uh, late December next year. So it's going to take a while to get there, but something to look forward to. Again, like last month, the zodiacal light is visible in the eastern morning sky before 6 a.m., starting around now for a couple of weeks. Um, you don't have to get up quite so early as last month. But uh, for those, but you do have to have a dark sky. You know, you have to get away from light pollution. It has to be clear. Uh, you know, you, you have to have good conditions to see it. Uh, but some people have managed to photograph it. Jupiter and Saturn, of course, dominate the southern evening sky. They're, they're past opposition. So when it, when it gets dark in the evening, uh, they're already, you know, in, in the south and sort of uh, setting. Uh, both of them, you know, both of these uh, planets do this retrograde loop around opposition. And this month, uh, they will resume uh, what's called prograde motion. Because right now, they're backing up and sort of heading west in the sky along with the stars. But then they whip around and start going east again in the sky. And that's what they do. the planets mostly do in the sky is go east but they're they're finishing their little loop the loop and uh, resuming that and uh, as i mentioned the moon passes october 13th to 15th neptune is in the evening sky in aquarius uh it doesn't change in brightness and size very much because it's so far away um you have to know where to look for it there's no easy way you know you have to look in a star chart and but you can pick it out in a telescope in a small telescope a larger telescope will show the color um, Uranus is also in the late evening sky, and if you would like to find Uranus uh, on October 21st, uh, it's, it's uh, uh, two degrees above the moon. So if you can get the moon, you should be able to find Uranus. Now I've got some pictures. Okay, so on the uh, left-hand side, this is this is where the moon is relative to. Jupiter and Saturn on Thursday, the 14th. Uh, on the 13th, it'll be a bit to the right, uh, west. And on the 15th, a bit to the left. And so here's Jupiter and Saturn uh, and the moon all within the, the constellation of Capricornus. And I can never forget this now since Quinn told me. Uh, he said, uh, if you don't like the eye, if you can't see a goat, then maybe you can imagine it's Orion's underpants. And so uh, I, I can't look at Capricornus without thinking of Quinn telling me that it's Orion's underpants. So there you have it. Uh, nearby is a reasonably bright star called Fomalhaut. Uh, it's uh, pretty low down in the sky, but bright enough that you can pick it out in the evening. And it's that's the uh, brightest star in the Pisces us. Australis, Austrinus, the southern fish. Uh, so up here we've got October the 9th, uh, Saturday 9th of October, the moon and Venus and Deshuba, which is one of the stars in Scorpius. So that's one I said would be a little bit of a challenge, but not, not impossible if you have a good horizon. Um, and that's a five degree 
uh, binocular view. Uh, and then uh, on the 21st of October, there's the five degree view of uh, the waning gibbous moon. Uh, this would be, again, would be sort of later in the evening, but if you're looking to identify Uranus, this is a good uh, way to do it. And then um, I got this extra one in, I hadn't mentioned, because it happens in November, but it happens before our next meeting. And I thought I would, I would uh, put it out there. Uh, this is, the, again, this is the morning, morning twilight. Um, so we've got Mercury and the waning crescent moon and the star Spica or Spica. Um, so there's, there's the photo op. Uh, if I remember, I think I'll go and try for that if it's clear. So, so interesting stuff going on with the planets. Um, now I'm going to do a little shout out for Algol. Uh, Algol is one of the classic eclipsing binary stars in the sky. And it's very well placed in uh, fall and winter after it gets dark to view. And uh, I'm, I, I don't always mention it, but uh, uh, the reason I'm mentioning it now is that there's three instances uh, in this month when you can watch the either, you, it's hard to watch the entire eclipse, like where it fades and, and um, and then brightens again. You, you can do it, but you, you sort of like, you'd be all night doing it. So what I've done is I've picked out three instances where you can watch either the star fade uh, or brighten in what I would say are civilized hours. So <laughs> October 5th or 6th, uh, uh, which is Sunday and Monday, uh, you can go out after, um, after dark and uh, you, you, you will see that Algol is bright. And then if you watch it for a few hours, you will see it progressively dim. And it would be fun to try to do that because it's very predictable and it's a fairly bright star. So with binoculars, you could watch it dim. Uh, on the 8th and 9th, uh, the opposite happens. It's well placed for brightening uh, starting around 9.15. And also again on the 11th, I mean, you can watch these eclipses any time, but I'm just highlighting the ones that are, like I say, in civilized hours. Um, um, there's other people who would watch it another time. So in the handbook, the minima of Algol are printed throughout the year, uh, but often they take place in you know middle of the day here or it's uh, some other awkward hour. Uh, but this is, this is a good opportunity in the coming month, and I guess maybe next month, or, a few of the winter months would be good good opportunities to uh, to view that. Um, explore the universe. It's our second month of that. The autumn constellations are now well placed in uh, when it gets dark. Um, Pegasus, Andromeda, Cassiopeia, Perseus, and Aries. Um, uh, four of those are involved in a in a great sky myth. Uh, in, in, uh, involving the monsters and beautiful maidens and uh, death and destruction. Um, I, I'm not going to repeat it here, but I, I, I feel like every amateur astronomer should know the myths and that go along with these constellations because they take a huge part of the sky. And so the myth must be important. But, uh, you know, none of these constellations are super, super prominent, I would say, like comparing Orion, say, uh, Cassiopeia is fairly easy to pick out, and Perseus is not bad. From my house, uh, I can barely pick out Andromeda, and I'm lucky if I can see the square of Pegasus. Um, but in a dark sky, they, they look fine. Uh, the stars uh, in the autumn sky in Explore the Universe are, the, are those ones listed. Uh, the brightest of them is Mirfak, which is not that bright because it's uh, that's Alpha Perseus. It's the 35th brightest star in the sky, in the whole sky. So the fall sky doesn't give you a lot of really bright stars, but um, the number of these stars are uh, navigation stars for celestial uh, navigation. And all of them are good for, um, if you have a SINSCAN uh, mount, um, Skywatcher sin scan mount. Those uh, are alignment stars, so it's good to know their names because, in the sin scan hand uh, control, they they use the names. So it's important that you be able to know what 
stars you're supposed to be aligning to uh, since they use the names um, there you go and then some of them might also work for the celestron i can never remember the celestron system there's a big overlap uh, as far as deep sky is concerned for Explore the Universe, I mean, there are quite a few deep sky objects in the fall sky, but Explore the Universe only has three. Uh, Andromeda Galaxy is kind of an obvious one. The double cluster uh, is a nice, obviously, a cluster. And uh, Melot 20, which is the association of stars around uh, Mirfak, Alpha Persei, is very nice in a pair of binoculars. Here's a picture I took from Blomidon, uh, and you can see those uh, two fairly large clusters of stars. Um, again, you know, uh, dark sky, there's no substitute for a dark sky when looking for these things, but uh, you can you can pick out sort of some of it uh, from the city, but um, for, for the double star part of Explore the Universe, uh, the list for autumn and winter is quite small, um, but I would recommend uh, going for uh, having a look at Delta Cepheus, which is also a, an important variable star. Um, Pat was just talking about variable stars. This is another standard one, the Cepheus, Delta Cepheus. But it all, it's, it's, it's a nice uh, double star in binoculars. It's uh, reasonably bright and fairly wide. And... Uh, um, and so is 16 Cygni and Theta 1 Taurus. Theta, Theta 1 Taurus is in the Hyades. Uh, so there's no harm, there's no harm, it's not hard to see. It's just that there's so gosh many stars in the Hyades, it's hard to know which one it is. So you might need a star chart to tease that one out for you. But, uh, and uh, that is the end of my presentation for this month. And I will, um, I will entertain questions if there are any or comments. Uh, Pat happened to comment that the squiggly constellation below the zenith is the doctor's signature. The what? The doctor's signature. Is that truth or is that the Kelly humor? I, th I think Ke Kelly's making it up. And, and which, which picture was that in? Was that in my... Just back up one, Dave. I think we'll, we'll capture it. Uh, one more. Oh, no, there it is there below... Uh, what? Where you have Delta Sept. Yes. Look at the squiggly line below those words. Oh, you need to go back one more. <laughs> All right, there's the zenith and there's the squiggly line below it. Uh, I think it's the lizard. Oh, that's Lacerta, isn't yeah, it? Yeah, but it looks like a doctor's signature. I've seen it up with them. Ah, so that is the Kelly humor. Yes. Uh, <laughs> yeah, I, I, I'm going to say that. Uh, that there would be a constellation that I uh, haven't dwelt on very much. So is it is it Lacerta or is it something else? Yep, Brad comments that I think he's referring to Lacerta. So you might be right. Yeah, um, I can't think of one interesting thing to say about Lacerta, I have to say, in, in my 60 odd years of observing. So if anybody's got anything more pertinent to say than what Pat said. I'd be interested in hearing it. <laughs> okay, I guess we're done then. Great. Well, thanks so much, Dave. And as Dave mentioned earlier, uh, if any of you would like to recap any aspect of this presentation today, you just have to go to our website. It's right there on the home page. You have to click on it. It'll bring you right to his um, PowerPoint slide set. So thanks again, David. Yeah, and, and uh, actually, Judy's going to later today send out an email announcing that that um, uh, presentation is available on the website. Aren't you, Judy? Yes, sir. <laughs> I will. I will, or Peter will, because he may have better luck in making sure it doesn't go to people's junk mail. <laughs> really? Okay. Yeah. But anyways, it will get out. Not to worry. Thank you. Okay. So I guess it's uh, me next. Uh, with news from the board. And, uh, so, as always, uh, we've had a, a habit uh, for about three years now of uh, bringing our members up to speed as to things that the board is working on, have made decisions on, and certainly some things as well from the national uh, office as well. 
If you need to contact the center or me specifically, my email is there and it's very easy. It's president at healthfacts.rasp.ca and I will forward your comments and questions to the appropriate body if it isn't me that uh, can uh, absolutely address it for you. So first and foremost, uh, it is that time of year again when we do our formal call for nominations to the board of directors. We have to follow our bylaw number one as it's required there. And we have a policy G6, which uh, better delineates the process which we have to go through. And the call of nominations are required by October 1. Uh, Peter, and thank you, Peter, uh, had sent out the call for nominations yesterday. So that requirement has been filled. And uh, as it states here, Peter is the chair of this. Uh, myself and Chris Young are members of the nominating committee. The board positions that we are looking for nominations um, and keeping in mind that current members, uh, I'm waiting to hear from all the current members to determine which ones are willing to offer their names again, but anyone can offer or be nominated for one of these positions, president, vice president, treasurer, secretary, or any one of the six directors positions. The honorary, there are exceptions to this in that um, the honorary president is a position that is held for five years. And Mary Lou Whitehorn, who is our current honorary president will sit in that seat until December 31st, 2023. So when nominations come up for 2024, we'll, we will be looking to that. And also the representative to national council is actually a position that is appointed by the board because it has to be a board member. So it's, it's nominated from there. The appointed positions are listed there. Editor, co-editor for Nova Notes, the observing chair, outreach chair, librarian, school manager, and chairs for those three committees. Uh, the Nova East Planning Committee is also uh, an appointed position, but until we figure out what the status is for Nova East in 2022, uh, we won't be searching out a, a chair for that particular position at this point. The board will be addressing um, Nova East until such times. So those are the positions that we are looking for appointments. So if you're interested, uh, please advise. The nominations must be received by the nominating committee before November 3rd. So that president at halifax.rast.ca or if you know Peter's email address, send it to him but otherwise nominations are being accepted for both elected and appointed positions. Uh, Halifax Center members, you'll be notified of the slate of nominees on November 13. The election of officers will be held at the AGM on December 4th, but the appointments to um, the elected board members, um, oh, sorry, appointments in January to, uh, will be made by the newly elected board of directors. They will not be elected at the members meeting. They will be selected uh, through the newly elected board of directors. SCO revised. Um, well, certainly we all know that SCO remains open to anyone that wants to go visit it. And from time to time, the board does reevaluate our position and regarding the guidelines for uh, the uh, use of the site. The Guidelines that were effective as of July 17 are still in effect. However, in the next few days, there will be a revision to the statement made. So keep your email, um, keep apprised of the emails and certainly it will be posted ASAP on, on our website once we have made any changes to it. One thing that the board did implement as of October 1 is this key fee. And happiness is having a key that you can then access a warm room, especially during the cooler, warming, uh, cool months of, of winter. And certainly this fall may prove to be a bit cool too. The key fee is only for those members who request a fee or a key. This is not for every member to be paying. It is only those that use SCO and would like access to the warm room, the observatory, and certainly to the, uh, the washroom that is there in that leftmost building. To Acquire a key, you must be a member of good standing for at least one year, and then you can uh, contact our school manager, John Ladard, and he will give you a tour of the um, site and provide you a key and show you how everything works together. We have a few center stars to, uh, to 
put forward. One is Liz Greeno. Congratulations, Liz. She's a busy beaver when it comes to observing. In June, she acquired her Explore the Moon uh, telescope version. And then in August, both she and Melody Hamilton acquired the binocular version of Explore the Moon. So congratulations to both ladies for doing so. And also Melody Hamilton, who I think at this point is probably the most decorated um, RASC member with respect to observing certificates uh, of anyone across the country. She was the very first one to complete the Double Stars program that had been developed uh, initially by Blake Nancaro, who's the RASC National Observing uh, Committee Chair. And I love his quote, Melody is the very first RASC member in the country to complete the new Double Star program. And of course, she sketched every target. For those of you that know Melody, she is certainly a very strong proponent of sketching everything you see. And so it is not surprising that she did such a thing. So congratulations to Melody and Liz for their accomplishments this past month. Also want to bring to everyone's attention, if you don't watch the CTV news um, on a regular basis, you would have missed on September 21st in the weather segment with Kaylin Mitchell, the David Hoskins photo uh, taken at York Redoubt called Harvest Moon Rising of the Ocean was used while Kaylin explained why the moon changed color from this golden hue, um, this harvest moon color to a white as it got higher in the sky. So good work, David. Also for those Halifax Center Stars wannabes, um, there are the National RASC Awards and there are great descriptions in the RASC Bulletin that just came out this past week. And you can certainly look for the details regarding each one of the award types on the RASC website. There's the Chant Medal, the Ken Chilton Prize, Service Award, the Simon Newcomb Award, the Keelak Award, and certainly the Fellow of the RASC. Many of our members have, um, I shouldn't say many members, each of those awards has at least one person from our uh, center that has held that uh, prize. The deadline for submission it's December 31st. So if you would like to nominate someone, please go online, look at the criteria for each one of those and determine if you want to nominate and go from there. You can send your nominations to Chris Gaynor at his email address. And again, if you have, don't have to worry about remembering it because it is in the brass bulletin as well as uh, on the website for this uh, awards. Also want to thank John and Lisa as co-editors for continuing to produce such phenomenal editions of Nova Notes. Uh, what you see here is the cover of the May, June one. Uh, the September, October is just about completed, but if anyone would like to submit an article for it, uh, they'll have to submit it by midnight tomorrow. So um, again, kudos to those two souls. And I've had a sneak peek at what they've got already, and I think you'll find it quite exciting. So if you'd like to contribute to it, please do so by sending your Submission to Nova Notes Editor at halifax.rask.ca. The member survey. If folks remember, we sent it out back in June and we received 15 responses. The board felt that we would like to get a few more. And I had hoped that we would be able to announce that it would be open as of today, but I have not heard back from National. So we will keep people apprised as to when it is reopened for a one week period only. So it'll be a short period in which you can um, respond to it if you have not already. Certainly if you've already done it, don't worry about it, you're off the hook. But we do need to hear from members as to their needs, suggestions for improvements and how we can better serve you. We can't read your mind, so you do have to uh, let us know by completing the survey and suggestions, <clears throat> excuse me, as to how we can do this are most welcome and not just during the survey, this holds true for any time throughout the year. In NOM, in International uh, Night of Observing the Moon, uh, as David has already told you, our center is not organizing anything here formally, uh, but certainly you can look for virtual events posted in the RASC weekly and uh, weekly in the NASA site that Dave uh, proposed to you. SCO Fundraising Committee, we are again implementing the SCO Astrophoto Sale. And we have three astro imagers that are again donating their incredible photos, but we would like to open the floor to other members who have photos that they would like to donate for this fundraising venture that goes towards 
um, ongoing upgrades to skull and maintenance, uh, we would certainly ought, love to see them. And um, the three members so far that have donated are Blair McDonald, Cherry Black, and Jason Dane. Uh, Blair will be the one that actually manages the, the printing and shipping to folk again. So thank you very much, Blair. Members can own one of their own images of that eight by 10 print. Uh, and it's a great present for the anyone during the holiday season that's less than three months away, I hate to say it. Uh, to find the SCO Astrophoto Sale information, there is a link on the home page with that very title, SCO Astrophoto Sale. But keep in mind that the photos will not be posted until December 1st. The cost of the photos, again this year, no rise in price, will be $30 each, and that includes the shipping and taxes. And the method of payment is the same as well. You can send by e-transfer to our treasurer, but be sure to state the name of the ashtray image you want, plus your name and address, because your email, ad email does not address does not provide that info. And certainly uh, if you prefer by check, there is the method to do that as well. And these are listed on our site. The calendars, 2022 calendars, they are available. And thank you to Wayne Harasimovich. Um, he is again, the, the center of the calendars on, on behalf of the center. They are again, $25 each. And just as a matter of note, this is about $4 cheaper than if you order them from National. So if you would like a calendar, please let us know. Again, the same methodology for payment through the treasurer, at the, through e-transfer or with a check in the mail. From the national side of things, the Insider's Guide to the Galaxy is once again, uh, every other Tuesday until the winter holidays. You have to register for the sessions but you can also watch them live stream to the, the Halifax YouTube channel. Uh, they're at 3.30 p.m. Eastern. Uh, there's the website that you can find them. And the next three coming up are October 12th regarding astronomy at other wavelengths, the 26th on binoculars observing, and November 9th on lunar ge geology. And Chris always puts on a fabulous program, so I'm sure everyone can benefit from that. Our upcoming meeting dates and events. Uh, as you can appreciate, due to COVID, our Zoom meetings continue. And there are our dates. Um, we have a, another speaker in mind for November 6th. We're just waiting to hear back to confirm. But Chris Young will again provide another uh, installment of his astronomy lore. On December 4th, with our members meeting and our AGM, uh, Dr. Phil Groff, who is our national executive director, is our guest speaker. And I say tentative date for January 8th. Um, because it hasn't been an approved date, but given January 1st is the first Saturday of the month, I don't think it'll be a problem with the January 8th. And Blair McDonald has agreed to speak to us on pandemic astro imaging. So something to mark in your calendars. And I mentioned about all the perks uh, that you get by joining RASC, but I didn't tell you how to join. Well, here's how. Uh, and just a refresher for those members so that if they want to tell people how they can do it, this is how they can. First of all, you, you go to, um, you can join us online by going to our site that says becoming a member. And if you click on the join, that's how you get to the uh, national site. You can fill out the form, make your payment, et cetera. But don't forget to set your affiliation to Halifax Center. Or if you're old school and prefer to fill in a handwritten form and send a check in, there is also the click on the word form and you can that will come up and you can fill that in. If you need assistance at any time with this process, um, you can certainly email mempub at rast.ca and they will assist you accordingly. And of course, as I mentioned, the health hacks perks, right? You get to participate in our discussion group. Uh, you also get access to our St. Croix Observatory and anything updated with respect to the observatory. So that's where I'm ending it. And any questions? I have a question, uh, Judy. Um, I, I don't object to the idea of having a key fee for SCO, um, but uh, for those people who already hold keys and have had them for some time, are they going to uh, need to get new keys and pay a fee? No. The members that currently have keys 
will not be responsible for paying any fees whatsoever. It is only those new to the center from now on. Okay, thank you. Uh, any other questions? Uh, Judy. Yes. Um, I contacted John, I don't know, it would have been earlier in the year looking for a key. And he'd mentioned there was some sort of issue with getting new keys. I can't remember if it was he couldn't get them or, or something occurred. Are new keys now available based on this key fee? Uh, John had the approval as of Tuesday night to make additional copies. Uh, so he will have some shortly if he hasn't already. Okay, thank you. But I would suggest contact him again, Troy, and I'm sure he'll be able to give you an answer on that. But um, he thank will you. have a, a few keys, yes. Okay. Well, that, that being um, the end of the meeting, I now call the meeting to a close and invite those members who wish to stay on for the Astro chat, chat to please do so. And I will end the recording as of now. So stay well, stay safe, and keep looking up. <laughs>